Now, delighted to say we have in studio a man with five All-Irelands, three National Leagues, four All-Stars, former Young Footballer of the Year, also Senior Footballer of the Year, man of the match in two All-Ireland finals, took a year out to travel Africa and further his studies. He's a doctor at Temple Street Hospital. He's still only 26 years of age. Jack McCaffrey, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me in. Delighted Thanks for coming in. No, it's great to have you in. So, how's life? Life is good, yeah. Life's good. Just kind of... Getting back to normality after Christmas, uh, had a nice bit of downtime, chilling at home and kind of getting back into work and slowly starting to think about football again too. So yeah, things are starting to come back to regular life. Should you not be in Bali? Should I not be in Bali? Um, no, th the lads are just finishing up the team holiday over there now at the moment. I'm, I, I have an exam coming up that I have to do for work and it just, the timings didn't fall particularly well for me. I was over there with Paul Mannion not too long ago, so I've I've got my Bally fix for this off season. I'm happy enough. When's the exam? Twenty second of January. What have um, we got? Not. Oh, it's just uh, as part of the kind of two year training scheme I'm on. You have to do three exams over the course of two years. So this is the first of the three, and hopefully hit the ground running and it, it all goes well. We'll see. So, uh, to reflect briefly on the year that was, I guess, because we haven't had Jane or a chance to talk about it, mm. uh, the five in a row thing, when you look back on it now, was that a pressure across the year? No, uh, well, look, we've, we kind of, it's the question that keeps getting asked now is if people expect that, that we were kind of keeping something wrapped up and now that it's done, we'll, we'll all come out in the open. Um, I've spoken about it before. We mentioned it at the start of the year because we're all adults, we're all relatively intelligent, we're you know, th there's no point hiding away from something like that. It kind of Jim just brought it into the room, said, this is going to be in the conversation as the year goes on, let people talk about it. Does anyone here have any strong feelings about it? Either way, it's done now, let's just go about trying to win the All-Ireland. Um, in the aftermath of the All-Ireland, it probably came into play a bit more for us all again. Uh, it, it just added a certain unique and even more special aspect to, to the win, but in the lead-up to it, I can honestly say it wasn't a factor for me. I can only really speak for myself, but I like to think that's the same for most lads. And when you say afterwards, it took an extra resonance. What jumps to mind? What images or memories or moments? So for me, it's probably the immediate aftermath, really, and um, Croke Park and, and wandering around there. Um, it just seemed like the, the energy you were getting from, from the fans that were left there and who stayed behind for a very long time mm. was just a little bit different. And you saw very emotional men and women who who you know probably could appreciate what we were doing a bit more while you're while you're trying to win in all ireland you're probably so focused on doing it that you you don't take in all the the context around it maybe mm. whereas um i'm sure a lot of the fans had had really taken to heart exactly kind of what what it would mean and and what was on the line and to see the kind of release that they had and then you kind of reflect that back as well and that's the kind of abiding memory for me. Afterwards, we we're kind of with our family and friends and you get your prolonged celebrations, but um, th that was kind of a really special half hour to an hour. I can imagine, difficult to describe probably in many ways. Yeah, it, it is, um, and I don't do it justice probably, but it was, it was just, look, you had to be dragged off the pitch kind of thing and, mm -hmm. and sometimes you, you really want to get back and, and meet your family and meet your friends and, and get, get on with the night as quickly as possible, but that day it was just, you were trying to soak in everything. It, it was really one of a kind. Mm, I'm sure. Because I didn't realise until relatively recently, I don't know how it passed me by, that your dad had won an All-Star and played in an All-Ireland final for Dublin. Mm. He's there up in the stand watching all this as well, with probably an extra understanding of what you're going through to a point. To a point, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Dad, dad played um, for a couple of years with Dublin, and unfortunately they lost the final to Kerry um, while he was playing, and he has won an All-Star, all right. Um, it's actually in pieces at home. I broke it when I was about three years old. I knocked it <laughs> off a shelf. So uh, I'm still getting slagged about that. But um, I, I suppose he he never tries to kind of live through me or anything like that. But it, it definitely, when I started playing with Dublin anyway, it was nice to have a kind of sounding board in the house who, apart from being my father and obviously a confidant in that way, mm. was also someone who'd been through the mill himself and, and had a bit of an understanding of what was involved. So he's, um, he's always been very good that way and, and someone I rely an awful lot on. When you talk about trying to almost stay away a little bit from the hype and the build-up to a game and maybe you almost engage with that a bit more at full time, mm. how good are you at doing that? Because you're out and you're working in the real world and you're meeting real people and I'm sure every patient who can or has an <laughs> interest is asking you how you're going to go at the weekend. So 
the smiling assassin that we see in the parade, which has now become a thing, as I suspect you're aware, yeah. What's he like on a Thursday and a Friday before a game? Yeah, so it, it definitely is a challenge, and it, it certainly was a challenge when I started playing with Dublin. You, you don't really realise until your first one how, how much an all Ireland final just takes over your life, and the energy you expend trying not to think about a game right. is, uh, can be quite counterproductive. So I suppose over the years I've, I've learned that I'm always kind of happy to, to talk football with people who come up to me. In the lead up to a final, it's bizarre. People just kind of think they own you and you're, you're walking along in the street and you just get grabbed by the collar and it's, you, no one introduces themselves. They're just like, well, what's the story? What's happening? Who's... And you, you kind of... It, it can be a bit shocking, but you develop kind of just little techniques and unfortunately you end up just trotting out the same old cliches. And I've gotten, your, your small talk is good, I'd say. Small talk is good. The key is not to stop walking whatever direction you're going. Just kind of slow down a little bit, but keep moving at all times. And... Uh, there are polite ways to tell people that you don't want to speak to them. Yes. Um, and has it taken a toll? Like, have you got better at it? Have there, have there been occasions where actually you rocked up the day of a final and thought, I'm a little bit drained here, actually, from this week? Um, there are, yeah, actually, you know what? The, the probably easiest juxtaposition I would have is the two finals this year because they fell so close together. Yeah. Um, and the first one, I kind of did my usual thing and chatted away to people while it was all kind of over the head. And then... Um, for the replay, I probably wasn't quite as good as, as I had been at that. Um, th there was just a lot more focus on me personally, given I'd played quite well in the, f in the first game. Mm. Um, and probably something I wasn't quite used to. Probably mentally, subconsciously, you, you were planning on just switching off then, and you'd kind of thought that this was not, not football time. Um, and I'd probably let my guard slip a, a little bit there. So what does that mean, let your guard slip? So it just probably means that you're, you find yourself not giving out the normal cliches, having a proper conversation with football nearly 24-7 for two weeks and then turning up to a match and, you know, some of the energy you've spent chit-chatting to somebody about a game maybe could have been better spent thinking about the actual match itself mm -hmm. in a proper player's way, kind of what might I do differently, what kind of different challenges I might face. Um, and I just didn't quite feel as on the money going into the, the second game, but... Interesting as well, lesson. Well. Yeah, yeah. Interesting lesson. I guess you must spend quite a lot of your life, certainly in mid-season, being very acutely aware of your energy levels, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, physically. You're almost taking a regular stock take across the <laughs> um, week. Yeah, you know, you do and you don't. Um, I suppose, from one perspective, like I'm, a tw I'm 26 years old. During last year's season, I was 25. Um, I'm kind of at the peak of my physical powers, or, or getting there. You're not overly worried. Like a, a long day in work isn't shouldn't really have a massive impact on on um, your your physical performance. But definitely, I've become a bit more aware of the psychological and, and, and mental side of things because I would have previously just said, not that it's nonsense, but you know it didn't bother me and I can just turn up and it's fine and we'll get going. Whereas now you realise that you know what if you have had a tough day in work and you've just been on the go all day and hadn't had a chance to to take stock yourself and then you run into training maybe 15 minutes later than you usually would be and you're scrambling to get ready and then you're just thrown into it. You just don't get the same uh, kind of return. Mm. So the, what I've found is just kind of being honest with yourself and even if you have to say it to the management, I, I just need kind of five, ten minutes here to, to reset or finding somewhere to, to take a break, um, even if it means that you arrive a bit later and people are like, God, you're cutting it quite close. At least you're arriving in the right frame of mind as opposed to just rushing through everything, so... Right. Um, the, they're, they're okay with that, they understand. Oh yeah, yeah, well, like, look, I'm, you're, not going to, you're not late for training. I suppose I usually would arrive at Dublin training an hour or more before training starts, as would most lads, right. um, whereas it might be a case of arriving half an hour before training starts, which is actually kind of being late in the eyes of most of us. But you might get a bit of slagging from somebody, but nobody's going to, you know, everyone yeah. has a life as well, so no one's going to take it seriously. Is the smiling in the parade thing, has this gotten a bit too big for you? Yeah, a bit, yeah. Um, do I smile? Do I not smile? That's the thing, like the whole <laughs> smiling in the parade <laughs> thing isn't the thing. That the, uh, what I've found has worked for me in football and in life in general is just kind of being relaxed and enjoying myself um, as much as I can. Mm. And I've always really enjoyed that kind of lull between a pretty intense build-up to a final and a warm-up and the actual ball being thrown in. I, I found that little lull to be a nice time to take a step back and just take a deep breath and chill out. Mm. And what that usually means to me is I kind of start smiling because I, I appreciate where I am and I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, 
Whereas again, to go back to that kind of drawn game, there was probably a huge deal made out of the fact that some camera caught me smiling, and like they've they've caught me smiling before, and I haven't performed it particularly well, and and there's no comment made. But then you just you have one good game, and and suddenly it, it's a bit of a thing that people latch onto, and so kind of counterproductively. It, it nearly felt like, oh crap, I, I better smile going around here and suddenly you're nervous about smiling and it, it's the whole... Am I smiling too much? Yeah, yeah, it's the antithesis of what it's meant to be, really, yeah. so... It's meant to be almost a private moment. Of, well, it's just like, if I, if, I, if I relax out there and, you know, I'm not feeling particularly smiley, that's fine. Yeah. Once I'm cool, calm and collected type thing. Um, as opposed to, I, I just don't want to force anything either way. Yes, no, I um, understand. So that. that's kind of where I've. Well, you can come up with a new thing for the new season. New thing, know, yeah, I'll we'll figure it out. Uh, when you score 1 3 in an All Ireland final and you play as well as you did, it must be just a joyous experience. And you, it looked like you felt like everything was motoring well. And even watching some of the scores again, the point you popped over with your left foot. Yeah, that won't happen again. The uh, casual ease with which you did that. And then the goal where you take off so early and you just head down sprint for a huge proportion of that move. Can you remember what you were thinking as you were sprinting in that moment? Because it's uh, such an incredible goal. No, not really. No. Th th there was kind of a... We knew that Kerry were pushing up on us, and so we knew that if we could win primary possession around the middle third, there, there would be something on. Yes. Um, so that was kind of the overall, the overarching kind of mindset. But no, it's it's too hectic. You don't have time to think, really, um, which is probably for the best in, in those kind of situations. Um, in terms of the performance, yeah, it's a funny one because there's, there's no point lying about it. I was absolutely delighted with how it went, but then we've drawn and there's yeah. a replay coming up. So um, you're, you're kind of, you can't be patting yourself on the back either. Um, and there's no point thinking, oh, Jesus, didn't I do great? Because, you know, you have to go out and do it again. Um, so that was another thing that was a bit unique about this year um, yeah. and the end of this year. There must have been a period in that first game where you thought this thing is looking less and less likely by the moment here. We are up against it. It was. It, it seemed like, as a team, you didn't lose your cool. Panic didn't set in. Didn't, yeah, and there's, there's great credit due to a lot of people for that, but I, I never thought we were going to lose until Cormac's point w was ruled off for a, by Hawkeye. It was, it was a judge to have mm. touched the post or whatever. Um, and I think that was somewhere in the 70 minute, 71st minute, maybe. And I remember kind of thinking, God, that doesn't really happen us and and it has and then you kind of glance at the scoreboard and not a long time left and we were a point down at that point and I that was the only time I kind of got a, a bit of a jolt and said geez this might not work out um, and from that point on the lads were phenomenal and like I find it difficult to describe how proud I am watching the last 10 minutes of that game of us as a, a team because mm. the the turnovers that some of the guys put in and the work rate and seeing Cloco come up to mark somebody and Kev Mack getting turnovers in around the middle third and everybody just kind of basically saying, OK, we should lose today, but we are refusing to. And Maybe their finest um, 10 minutes in some ways because of the level of adversity and the pressure. It, yeah, look, and that, that, you know, like... You don't need teams, to rank it, the 10 minutes. That, that's kind of a, a difficult one to, to do, but it certainly, it was just for all the kind of good football we play and, and good footballers we have, mm. that was just sheer resilience and character and I'm delighted that we got to show everybody that, that we have it in spades. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Jim Gavin's departure took you totally by surprise? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I'm one of those that it did. Uh, I think w I'm, most of us were taken by surprise. He'd left it a while, certainly on the outside I thought well it had gone past a certain point where he was going to announce it. Yeah, um, he had, I suppose, for him and for Declan and for Jason, it's a huge decision to make uh, on a personal level. And I just think they took their time until they were 100% sure that it was the way they wanted to go. Um, and once they did, they, as they always have been with us, were completely honest and upfront and just, just let us know. Um, so it, it was an interesting couple of days. And I suppose initially you were, you were quite sad. And then... Did you get emotional? Yeah, yeah, I would have. Well, you know, outside of my immediate, immediate family, for the last seven years, they've been the most important people in my life, um, which is a bit sad to admit, but they, uh, it, was, it was certainly an emotional day or two. We kind of met up for a few drinks that night and swapped stories a bit, and then there was, there was probably 48 hours of that 
and it very quickly kind of galvanised us as a group a bit, I think, okay. to uh, to look towards next year. And it certainly kind of started the excitement taking a little bit earlier than it, it might otherwise have. So while that was a, a challenging time for us, I think it's it's kind of set us up, well, I hope it's kind of set us up really well for, for next year and kind of really giving it a good go under Desi. And what kind of relationship did you have with Jim? Would he have been somebody, for instance, who would have routinely given you a phone call for a chat away from training? Or was it close in that way? Or was it pretty much, almost, I don't want to say business-like, but you know, I see you training, I see you matches, and that's kind of our relationship. No, so you could always pick up the phone, and I, I would have received phone calls as well, but not, not in a kind of, any kind of regular way. Um, I would, Ken was a, a friend, mm. but I think that when you are managing a football team, it is incumbent upon you to keep a little bit of a, a buffer between yourself and players. So there was a real, the door is always open policy and there was kind of joking and chatting away, but there was very much a sense that, you know, J Jim might at some point make a decision that I don't want him to make yes. and he's the manager and we go with it. Um, so there, there was no kind of blurring of those lines anyway. Yeah. I guess that's important. I, like in terms of, he's obviously shaped, I guess, most of you guys in many respects and how you approach your, your inter-county life. Would you have gone, you know, could you have gone two, three, four games without much feedback from him very easily? Or w was every game met with detailed feedback on your performance? Um, geez, I have to think. I suppose, no, you definitely could have gone, gone through a couple of games, maybe in the league anyway, with, with a very, general like this we all know what you're working towards and what you have to work on and it's not an overnight fix type thing you and, and just keep moving along and if you ever wanted feedback it was there and readily available right. um but then during the kind of latter stages of the season and certainly into the championship you would get very detailed feedback and it would as much as you wanted you would get like he 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 would have everything any example, any, any example of something? Um, well, the, you? the only other thing is that it, it didn't necessarily always come from Jim. It, the, the management kind of split things up and there were defensive coaches and attacking coaches and whatnot. Um, any specific examples? Not particularly, to be honest. Usually it would be, well, for myself, it, it would kind of be a particular situation in a game and were you happy with how you did that and what about this and would you consider that? And it, it was more it was never really, you did something wrong and this is what you should do. It was more challenging your thought process at a certain point and, and maybe giving you a different perspective on it. So that, that was kind of the, the general gist of things. I, I don't have any specifics off oh, that's hand. That's interesting, even that it's more of a conversation. Although I take it that when they sit down and they say to you, were you happy with this moment? The answer is the answer yes. Is, <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you'd, you'd fight it just to see what happened. But um, there, yeah, you kind of, I, I'd imagine we usually ended up reaching the conclusions that they wanted us to reach. I would have thought so. So where does work uh, fit into all of this now? You're missing the team holiday, that's unfortunate, and you've got your exam. Did you say you're in the midst of a two, three-year, two-year? A two-year job, yeah, so... Are you fully qualified at the end of that? Um, so it, it's a funny one. I, I'm fully qualified uh, as a doctor, and I'm now training in the paediatric base. It's called the basic specialty training, and that's a two-year job, which is four, six months rotations. And then at the end of that, you can either attempt to get onto a five-year training course at a higher level straight away, or you can maybe take a year to do a bit of research or explore different jobs before going into that. But ultimately, you have to do the two-year course, the five-year course, and at the end of that, technically, you could be going for consultant jobs. But uh, in reality, you probably need to spend a couple of years either abroad or doing a bit of research and other bits and bobs to... Okay. Uh, Pad the CV a little bit. I mean, it's, it's arduous training. Do you know what you're going to well, do? You're, at the you're end working, of the I suppose. Well, I suppose so you it, are. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, it, uh, it's not like we're constantly Pastors, training. It, yeah. it, it's go going out and getting experience. Do you know what you're going to do at the end of the two years? Um, no, no. I'm kind of locked in till July 2021 with this current job, and then I'll have to have a little think about. Well, shortly before then, I'll have to have a little think about what comes next. Yeah, you're at Temple Street. Temple Street actually finished on Friday and then I'm heading there to Kilkenny for six months. Okay. So that'll, be, uh, that'll be good fun, looking forward to getting down there. So you've, you've opened down the road to training. And what's Temple Street been like? It is phenomenal. Um, it's been a really, really special place to work. 
it's kind of somewhere I was very familiar with growing up in Dublin and being an active kid and picking up bangs and bruises and then going to school in Belvedere we or just across the road. So Temple Street was called, kind of always in the background of my life growing up. Mm. And then to work there, I don't know if you've ever been in, I hope you haven't, but it, it is a, like it's essentially three or four houses that have been repurposed into a hospital. It, it is in no way, shape or form, it was not meant for what it currently is doing, but the, the character in the place and the work ethic of the staff just across the board and the attitude and the, the kind of happiness they bring to the table to to create a nice environment for kids to kind of recuperate and get better is incredible and in terms of kind of forming a culture and getting a good team ethic mm. in place I, I couldn't have asked for a better place to learn um, so it's it's been a really phenomenal six months and it flew in it was a really really quick one and day to day is it does it become difficult spending time around sick children and I'm sure there's some dark days where bad news happens or death happens frankly and you're um, able to cope with that. Is that a routine thing? Thankfully not a routine thing, no. Um, it, it, it's really, really enjoyable by and large and yeah, there are days that, that aren't unfortunately um, nice to be a part of but, you know, it's important to remember that if you weren't there that these bad things are happening anyway. Yes. It, 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 you know, it's not the case that it would just not exist if you kind of turned a blind eye. Um, do you, do you, is there counselling available? Do you go and talk to people after bad days or if you're feeling, I, I, I don't want to put feelings like guilty, I could have done more there or mm -hmm. you know we could have had a better outcome there. Do you, do you talk to people when stuff like that happens? Yeah, well I suppose the first thing to flag is that I'm at a pretty early stage in my career and I'd be very well insulated from probably the, the key decision making in, in obviously life or death instances yeah, exactly. um, or frankly making any of the, of the vital decisions around management but there's a, so there's a very informal network uh, first of all of people who keep an eye out on each other in terms of your, your colleagues and um, everyone kind of understands what people are doing and, and by and large most people would have gone through most situations so um, th there is that and I think thankfully I haven't had to avail of anything like that but I do think that if you're involved in a particularly bad case there are supports available mm. and recommended that you avail of but Fortunately, I've Managed not come to. into that yet. Yeah, good. I guess you get to make friends with a lot of the patients who are there long term as well. Yeah, we've a couple of um, couple of long termers, and I suppose Christmas there was was cool in that the the staff again in there just move heaven and earth to get anyone home who can okay. possibly get home, and I suppose those that are left there unfortunately are are there because they they just have to be in hospital to be managed, but there's a really nice atmosphere, and yeah, as you correctly mentioned, there are a couple of couple of kind of local celebrities who have been there for donkeys years and uh, who are kind of a part of the furniture now uh, and some of whom are kind of moving towards home soon which is also very exciting yeah. so uh, it, it's great and you'll find that there are one or two patients around the place who everyone knows and even though you've no business to you'll just make your way by their room at some point and pop the head in and have a chat and yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a part of what makes it a really nice place to work. Do you get a sense of fulfillment from that? I think a lot of people maybe in their jobs do wonder, geez, what's the value on a day-to-day -day basis? And the, the one they'll quote is, God, like a doctor off saving lives. Do you get that <laughs> sense of um, fulfillment from it? Yeah, I, well, yes, to be honest. Um, not every day. Again, I, <laughs> I cannot stress enough because I'll just get slagged in work if people yeah. think I'm... I'm <laughs> making it look like I, I run the show. It oh, is. I understand, it, I understand. There, there's very much a chain of command, and I'm quite at the bottom of it. But yeah. there are there are certainly days that you walk away and go, you know what? And it, it's probably the the night shifts and stuff when you're not doing your regular nine to five and you're on call and you have to help out and kind of in more maybe emergency situations um, that you feel, you know, I I was pretty good today and I I helped out and what I did made a difference and that's really nice. You always kind of leave with a bit of a smile on your face. Yeah, I can imagine. That, those moments are huge. And what, do you have a long-term aim yet? Do you know where you want to be in 20 years with it all? Uh, no, no. So the, one of the good things about paediatrics, one of the many good things, is that you can, or you do train quite generally initially, and then as you kind of come towards the end of it, start picking a, a special interest. Or you can work as a, as a generalist. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I love the hospital environment. I really like working there. So it, I'd certainly like to stay in hospital medicine and where exactly that is, I don't know. 
I'll figure it out at yeah. some stage. Yeah, yeah. How compatible is it with um, Dublin football at the moment? And is it going to stay as compatible for hopefully the next 10 years of your life, give or take? 10 years? <laughs> I know. You've got another 10 <laughs> All-Irelands in you, surely. Do not wish that. If I'm playing for Dublin in 10 years, you have permission to shoot me. I am... Um, it is currently fine. Uh, I suppose starting in Thames Street, we rotate in July and January every year. And starting in Thames Street was a bit tough, uh, just in terms of you're meeting new colleagues. And frankly, you do need people to do you a favour. And in terms of swapping shifts, especially when you bloom and go and draw an All-Ireland final, that was when my co-SHOs, I have to say a big thank you to. But I'm sure you'd spent weeks saying, I promise you, once we get past this Sunday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then it just keeps rolling. Um, the, the only thing is that, I suppose, what's notoriously challenging is when you end up doing a shift in A&E and you're, you're doing shift work, because while hospital medicine, you, you do do call, by and large, you're, you're kind of doing a eight to five, nine to six, whatever kind of job. So it's, it's semi-regular. Mm. Um, whereas when you're in the emergency department, it's, it's completely shift work. So that will bring its own challenges. But then look, you've, you've inter-county footballers who are farmers who are up at the crack of dawn out doing sure. arduous physical work all day you've you've every kind of career under the sun represented so you know i don't think medicine brings its own little challenges it can be done it just takes a bit of doing yeah uh, why, why um, do i have permission to shoot you if you're still playing for dublin 36 would this, not, would this not be a triumph six, would this God. not be fantastic no i i will have no hamstrings left um ah look i i'm really enjoying football at the moment uh, but i i can't see myself in 10 years uh, still doing the, the same stuff I'm doing at the moment. I yeah. don't know where in the world I'll be. I see, I read, I, read, uh, I think it was in the Irish Independent website, you've signed Stephen Cluxton up for 2020, I, I saw that, yeah, that was this morning. They were very quick to, uh, to, to publish that one. Well, what did uh, you say? You, 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 just, you have a sense he will? I don't know. They, yeah, they're very strange. He just asked me, was Stephen playing next year? And I was a bit taken aback because I didn't know that that was uh, being discussed even. Um, so... Again, I, I don't speak for other people, but my understanding is that he is uh, is ready to go um, and wants to play again. So I'm open to correction. I'm sure he'll he'll ring me this evening if I have that wrong. I'm but sure he will. That, that's what I've gone to press with. <laughs> um, Desi Farrell, how well do you know him? Were you just past the the group who came no, through? Did no, you work under him? yeah. So it was kind of my year. That's kind of the split. So from myself down would all have kind of been coached or managed by Desi at some point and okay. from myself up um, wouldn't have. So I know Desi really, really well. Obviously I haven't played under him in, uh, in God, what now, six years. Mm. So it, it's, it's been a while and I'm sure he's changed a bit no more than I have. But um, really excited to see what he brings to the table. I think he was absolutely the, the most logical and best choice mm. for Dublin. I, I was just worried that he wouldn't be available because I know he's a very busy man and it's a big commitment, but I'm delighted he's he's taken it up. And uh, I suppose we haven't really started yet, so it's hard to comment on it, but, sure. but I, I really hope it, and I feel like it will go very well. I saw him, um, I mean, look, with a view to 2020, the attacking marks coming in, and I know you were very critical of that when it was first announced. Have you softened in that stance or are you dreading this as much as ever? Um, no, I, I do think it's terrible, but I, I suppose I've, probably resolved that I should I should at least see it yes, before I okay. um, continue to... But, but your, your, your fear, it. sorry, I should have said for people who didn't see your initial comments, was effectively this is just in, increasing the likelihood of a stop-start game, which is the antithesis of what we want. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, since I've been involved with inter-county football, there have been a number of rule changes, and they've been kind of like where the kick-out is taken from, there's the black card, there has been the midfield mark... I don't think any of them kind of intrinsically changed the way football is played, to be honest. Um, and I think this has the potential to, a little bit. Again, I've decided I, I will sit on my hands a bit until yeah. it's it, it, it either works or it doesn't, because I'm sure people laboured over it long and hard and, and, and lost sleep over whether it was a good idea. And I'm just coming in kind of with my instincts. But <coughs> I don't know, I, I, I suppose I presume it's been brought in to counter a very defensive football, which I don't think we're seeing as much of anymore. No. And also, I think if you kind of logically work through this, it could actually have the exact opposite effect. Um, in that you now have to mark a defense, you have to mark a forward in a way that he cannot catch the ball clean, but you cannot overcommit because he'll turn you and score a goal. So probably the logical thing to do is to put someone in front of him and someone behind him. So look, we'll see what happens and. We're stuck with it for a little while anyway, so we'll uh, 
we'll give it a go. It's unfortunate timing because I think the tide had turned on the style of football we were seeing, especially in the last year. Too, we were, yeah. I mean, even the way Cork went at you guys, I mean, it was yeah. a brilliant game, and and and, and about that. we're seeing we're seeing more of that. Well, I will we'll come back to you if three games into the Leinster Championship, you're repeatedly marked six foot six lads who are <laughs> jogging over to you and saying, uh, "Landed on me, lads." That. I, I've already been targeted for high ball, so uh, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. We'll be all right. What would you change about Gaelic football? That aside, what would you change about the state of Gaelic football if you could, if you could make sweeping, um, easy changes? I, I wouldn't change a whole pile about the sport. I suppose I, I'd love to play more for Clontarf than I currently do. How often um, would you get out? So last year, last year I picked up a few little niggles, in fairness, which is nobody's fault, but. I'd say maybe on average you're talking maximum four league games and whatever championship games you're in. My club situation is a little bit different in that we're not we're not kind of solid Division One team yet that are guaranteed to remain in Division One at all times. So it's very hard to see a world in which you can challenge for the Dublin Championship without being a, a kind of ever present team in Division One. So whereas other clubs are perfectly happy to have all their players available for championship, we, we kind of are in a slightly different phase, okay. as are a lot of clubs. So it, it's a bit annoying because you, you often hear people just say, ah, oh, well, they're available for championship. It's like, you yeah, know, that's a bit short-sighted. Um, the structures of the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, it, it is a very difficult kind of trying to serve two masters or three masters or whatever amount of masters there are, but it is... Um, it's just important because it's it's kind of the it is the foundation of everything and um, while Clontarf I know are very proud to have me involved with the Dublin team and have supported me all the time I'm sure they'd love to have me available to play mm. a little bit more regularly too yeah I'm I'd sure love to be there. and plenty of clubs around the country are saying the same thing so uh, I guess good luck with the exam and you're probably back into Dublin training very, very soon whenever these lads come back from Valley. Is that the gist of it? That's the gist of it, yeah. Pretty much well summarised. Okay, well listen, thanks so much for coming in. And I should say Jack McCaffrey is the Dennis Manny Toyota brand ambassador. He's a driver of the Toyota CHR. And you can discover the range of new Toyota hybrids and 201 offers at Dennis Manny, Kilbarrick and M50. Jack McCaffrey, thanks a lot. Thank you.